So far in this course and also prob most likely, probably in your previous micro courses, you have talked about and looked at markets in partial equilibrium, as in you're used to looking at one market in isolation. However, when you think about an economy, it, an economy consists of many, many markets. You know, think about all the goods that are available, even just to consumers here in Ireland, it's a lot. And so these markets are obviously interdependent. They are interdependent because uh, everyone only has a certain budget to spend. And if they don't spend it on one good, they spend it on another good. Um, but also because some goods may be, the, the, the demand for these goods may be related, um, such as popcorn and, and cinema tickets, for example, right? Uh, where, where if the demand for one goes up, the demand for the other tends to go up as well because they're complements. And economists have a uh, tool to look at a large number, a large yet finite number of markets, and to study the interdependencies between those markets. And obviously, if we want to say something about the effect of a policy, we do not only want to consider the one market where that policy may work the most, but we also obviously want to study how that, that policy then transmits to, to other markets in that economy. The reason why we're doing this, besides trying to, to get to a slightly more realistic picture of the economy, is that in general equilibrium, even if we just consider two goods rather than one, so two markets that that are interdependent, you will see that quite some of the conclusions from partial equilibrium do not carry over to general equilibrium. And so for that reason, it is very important to, to know about general equilibrium. And uh, it's, it's a very important tool to, to study um, any, any sort of uh, economic policy. Now, in this video, we will lay the groundwork for our study of general equilibrium. So I will provide you with a lot of notation that in and of itself will probably not yet make overly much sense to you. But this video and the next two or three videos together will give you the, the what you need to carry out the simplest possible or the, the most insightful uh, general equilibrium analysis um, at the at the undergraduate level. Mm? So we will consider a very simple case at the start. We will assume that there is an economy where there is no production, there's just consumption, so everyone owns some goods that they can exchange with others. And we assume there's only two consumers. So the roadmap not only for this video, but for the next couple of videos that talk about general equilibrium is we start with the simplest possible economy. We study the equilibrium in this economy and then think about the implications of things like an economy with more consumers and producers. Think about information asymmetries, you know, do consumers know more uh, about the market and producers, what does that, what role does that play in, um, in, uh, for, for economic policy? Does, for example, a government know less about people's earnings potentials than the people themselves? What, what implications for economic policy does that have? And we're going to look at so-called market failures, um, which is things like monopolies and, uh, and, uh, and externalities, especially externalities. What that is, an externality, we will come to in a couple of, uh, of, of lectures, but here just a, a quick glimpse into that. Okay, so what we assume is that Firms have no price setting power on this on these markets, so they are price takers. 
So there is no monopoly power or no oligopoly or anything like that. Okay? Um, in the, and there is not even firms that produce anything. There is just consumers here who have an endowment each and can exchange that endowment against other goods. And so in that sense, uh, each consumer is a consumer and a firm at the same time. Okay? And so consumers through their actions have no, no price setting power. That does not mean that they cannot through their, their utility maximization and through their demand and supply of whatever goods they want to exchange affect prices. Their behavior will affect prices, but it's not that they can dictate the prices because they have market power to other consumers in the economy. What we also assume is that that competition on this market is purely private. So there are no externalities. What does this mean? The enjoyment of a good for myself only affects my own utility, but does not affect the utility of someone else. A good that has an externality, an example for such a good would be smoking, right? If I smoke a cigarette, um, I may enjoy that, but the smoke may harm someone else, either by just making his life unpleasant or making uh, you know causing some health problems and so that the fact that my consumption affects the utility of someone else that that's one example for a, a an externality so an externality is always present whenever the consumption or production of one unit uh, affects the utility or profit of another consumer or firm um, we also initially assume that consumers have the same information. The government knows everything about consumers. So let's start with the pure exchange economy. So there is no production. People own goods and they can exchange these goods uh, for, you know, so the one person owns, uh, I don't know, a lot of pens. Uh, the other person owns a lot of notebooks and then they can they can exchange so that each of them can write something. Okay? So the, 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 the notation here is as follows. We have two consumers, A and B. Um, we have two goods, good one and good two, and we have each of those goods obviously has a price. So here you see the, um, uh, the, the notation. So we will have the subscript uh, one or two for, the, for good one and good two, and the superscript for uh, the, the, the consumer A or B. And later when we also may introduce producers, then that, that may also extend to producers. Um, now, uh, P, as uh, is will be the price so that's for the price of good one or the price for good two um omega is the endowment so person one sorry sorry person a has a certain endowment of good one and a certain initial endowment of good two and the same goes for person b so person b will also have a certain uh, endowment initially of good one and a certain endowment of good Two. So that's what they initially own and they can then exchange in that economy. Once again, what we don't assume here, any, we don't assume anything about the institutional framework that makes this, this exchange possible, right? We just implicitly assume that this, this exchange happens and is, you know, everyone's able to, to enforce all the the, the, you know, to enforce the transactions, to carry out the transactions without any obstacles. Okay. Now, the formal representation of the endowments, as I said, so each person has a, an endowment vector um, of certain number of items of good one and certain number of items of good two. So for simplicity, call the two people, Andrew and, and, and Betty. And so in that case, Andrew would have five units of good one and one unit of good two and Betty would have two and six. So we have initial endowments and we have preferences. So each consumer 
has preferences over good one and good two. And so when we'll both trade, well, both will trade if either the utility functions differ or the endowments differ or both, right? Because then there is scope, there is typically scope for gains from trade, as in through trade, each of them, or at least one of them can reach a higher level of utility. So if you look at the endowments here, um, you know, Andrew owning a lot of good one, Betty a lot of good two, unless they have preferences where Andrew has a huge preference for good one, Betty a huge preference for good two, um, unless they have that, if they have a preference for, for consuming each good in, in, you know, more or less equal measure, then we would assume that there are gains from trade between both. That's, that's the logic here. So the good bundle that someone consumes, not that someone necessarily owns, but someone consumes, um, is uh, denoted by X. So X1 H is the amount of good one that person H consumes and the same goes for X2. Now, what we also assume is that each person has a certain budget and can only use that budget to, uh, to trade. And the budget first and foremost is defined by their endowments. So again, that person has an initial endowment of omega one and omega two, and that endowment valued by the prices is how much they can actually then uh, then spend on good on the consumption of good one and good two by engaging in trade and and the, these x and and omega may not be the same if they trade right so so if andrew owns a lot of good one um uh, his endowment of good one is high but he may actually trade some of that uh, with betty for good two and in that case his his consumption of good two will be higher than his endowment and the consumption of good one will be lower than his endowment. Um, so, but importantly, um, the value of these initial endowments, they depend on the prices. Okay, so, so here, is, here is a simple example, um, how, to, how you would calculate Andrew's initial endowment simply by multiplying those fictitious prices with those uh, initial endowments. Okay. Um, but what is important here is that those prices may actually change through the trade activities and through basically the interaction of two people with potentially different utility functions in this market. So they have different utility functions, which means that they may demand uh, different amounts of, of, of a certain good. And, and uh, as such, the, the, the prices may actually change relative to what they would be if everyone just consumed their own endowments. Right, so, so the trade process is, is really what, what makes the prices adjust. Right? And that's, that's how um, economists view and you know that that's one way how economists view an economy it's just a lot of interdependent markets and uh, we can reach and we can show that there is an, an equilibrium whereby many many markets at the same time are in equilibrium and though the vector of those prices for all those markets at the same time is called market clearing prices Again, what we also assume is that all agents behave rationally, so the return of the Homo economicus um, is, is imminent. And uh, so, so they just maximize each their utility subject to their budget constraint. We also assume that there is no borrowing or saving, um, but that's an assumption that can also be relaxed. It just makes the model a little bit more complicated. More on that in more on general equilibrium analysis in future videos.